Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. We're just going to read a few verses. It is Hot Topics Month, so if you're following us on our YouTube or Facebook or social media network, it's a Hot Topics Month here in the month of June 2019. We're excited that you're able to be with us. And we're going to talk about some things. We're going to deal with some things. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 it says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Did you know that you could be successful? You can be successful. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, before you're seated, I want to ask you this question. You ever heard people say the phrase, oh, I can't right now. My money's a little funny. You ever heard that term? Money's a little funny right now. I can't do that. But you know what I've learned is that money's not funny. People are funny. Before you're seated, shake your neighbor's hand and tell them, people are funny, not money. That's what I've learned. People are funny, not money. Money's not funny. Money is a resource, not the source. We're going to talk about this. Money is a resource, not the source. Now, here this morning, if you want what normal people have, then you must do what normal people do. In other words, if you want to live a stressed out life and always feeling empty on the inside all the time, then live like normal people live. But if you want what few people have, in other words, peace, love, fulfillment, meaning, and purpose, then you have to get off the normal road and get on the narrow road. You have to get off the normal road and get on the narrow road. In Philippians chapter 4, I'm actually going to give you a lot of scriptures today. So if you're taking notes, if you're putting it there on your phone, if you're writing it with a pen, I know some of the millennials like a pen. What's a pen? I've never heard of a pen. But there's actually a little piece of plastic. It has ink in it. And at the end of it, you actually write things down. It's crazy. It's a trip. I know. I know a lot of the young people are like, I've never heard of that before. Because they're just, they click and type everything. Click, 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 click. So if you want to click, you can click as well if you're clicking notes. But the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, it says, For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Now, this is a key here this morning. You're going to hear me say that word a lot. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. Somebody say, whatever the circumstance. Now, this is very important. You can apply this to finances or you can apply this to just your even emotions. Learning how to be content. Matter of fact, there's a story of an American investment banker. And he was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman had docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellow fin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took for him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't he stay out longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then asked him, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman looked at him and said, well, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, take siestas with my wife, Maria. I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play the guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed at him. I'm a Harvard MBA, and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing, and with the proceeds, buy a bigger boat. Now, with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. 
You would control the product, processing, and even the distribution. You would need to leave the small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then L.A., and even eventually New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked him, but how long will this take? To which the American replied, oh, about 15 to 20 years. But what then, asked the Mexican. The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich, and you would make millions. Millions? Then what? The American said, that's the best part. Then you would retire Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play with your guitar with your amigos. Why would I strive after the American dream when I am content with the dream and the vision that God has given me? Far too often, there are too many people that have not learned the secret of success. And I'm here this morning to tell you the secret of success. Are you ready for it? It's found in Philippians chapter 4. If you want to write it down, here's the secret of success. It's right there in Philippians chapter 4, plain black and white, right here. In verse 12, it says, right after verse 11, it says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I have learned how to be content in whatever circumstance. It's the secret. That's the secret. Learning how to be content. Now, this is very important. The word content is mentioned seven times in the scriptures, and six of the times it has to do with money. Seven times it's mentioned, and six times it has to do with money. Now, this is also very important. He says, I have learned. So in other words, this isn't something that just happens in your DNA. Actually, within your DNA, it's your DNA to get more. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. So Paul says here, I have learned. So for those of you that are here this morning, say, well, that's not me, pastor. Uh, that's just not in my DNA. That's not how I was made up. I was made. I was born to hustle. I was made to go out there and get mine. I was made to go get it. That's how I was made. But I'm telling you here this morning, I don't care how the world made you I know how God made you and I know that the principles and the lessons that he has taught us we can learn you can learn this look at your neighbor say you can still learn this he says that this is the secret now here's a little something when you put these scriptures together that you may help you when you put these scriptures together it has to do with three quick things I'm not going to go over them there's a lot to this message and I'm going to try my best to get through it as quick as possible. But there's three quick things that you see here. And that is knowing, doing, and trusting. Knowing, doing, and trusting. In other words, knowing what God requires of us in handling money and possessions. Doing what is required of us. And also trusting God to provide exactly what he knows best. So you know what I've learned is that our society has always had a fascination with money. You ever notice that? Our culture has always had a fascination with money, from the rich to the poor. We have always desired the fascination with money. As a matter of fact, this is actually what classifies the difference between the rich and the poor. It's money. That's how we're able to classify and see. See, money has such a strong hold over one's mind that just the mention of the word brings the antennas up on anybody who listens. Books are written about this. Movies are made about this. Songs are written about this. Matter of fact, if you're a movie buff, you know that there's a movie called The Color of... Uh, if you're here from the Bay Area and you know uh, there's actually an Oakland A's team, they made a movie about them called Moneyball, right? Uh, if you're from the 80s, you know Tom Hanks, uh, they made a movie called Money Pit. Right? You remember that? The Muddy Pit. Uh, there was a movie I remember watching. I, I, I still remember watching. It's like ingrained in me uh, when, when uh, Cuba Gooden Jr. And, and Tom Cruise, they were talking. And you go, say it, Jerry. Say it. I want I want to hear it. Show me the money. Say it. Oh, louder, Jerry, louder. Show me the Show me the money. 
There was a song back in the days, I believe, by Cindy Lauper. She said, money, money changes everything. Oh, you guys don't know in the 80s? Okay, all right, cool. That's fine with me. She had a song. Uh, even, uh, I think it was uh, David Bowie had a song called Red Money. Right? Red Money. Uh, B-I-G, G-I. Mo money, mo. Mo money, mo problems. I grew up with a song. Every time I would hear it, I would just, I mean, it was ingrained in me. Like, it was just there. I would hear it every morning, every night. Every morning, every, everybody always played this song. Rolling down the street, cleaning windows, <laughs> sipping on orange juice. Uh, that's the remix. I got to give you the remix. <laughs> remix. It's a Christian remix right there. But if you go laid back with my. It's there. The best things in life are free, but you can give it to the birds and bees I need. Every generation, it's ingrained in you to attain more money. Keep your mind on your money and your money on your mind. That's how you got to get your hustle on. You got to get, you got to go for it. Now, the problem with that is that when your mind is always on your money and money is always on your mind, then you're always going to be stressed out, striving for something that will always slip through your fingers. You will never learn how to be content. You'll never learn how to be content. Somebody say content. See, not only is our society intrigued with money, but we are intrigued with other people's money. You ever notice that? Not just our money, but I'm intrigued about how much money they have. Oh, I want to know about Bill Gates. How much money Bill Gates have? How, I wonder how much money Steve Jobs left to everybody. Like, we're just intrigued about everybody else's money. Not just our money, but everybody else's. For some reason, it seems to be more interesting than our very own money. Matter of fact, there's a story about a dog and a bone. This dog held a juicy bone in his jaws as he crossed a bridge over a brook. Now, when he looked down into the water, he saw another dog below with what appeared to be a bigger, juicier bone. He jumped into the brook to snatch the bigger bone, letting go of his own bone. He quickly learned, of course, that the bigger bone was just a reflection, and so he ended up with nothing. See, if you keep trying to attain other people's riches, you'll never truly appreciate the one that you have. John Wesley said it like this, when I, when I have money, I get rid of it quickly, lest it find a way into my heart. Or oh, I like the way Jackson Brown said it best. He said, no matter how hard you hug your money, it never hugs back. No matter how hard, it ain't going to hug you back. It ain't going to love you back. Come on, bone thugs and harmony. For the love of I love that song. Yeah, but the song don't love you back. You got to learn how to be content with what God has given you. See, this is what I've learned. Contentment is both the fruit and the tree. Now watch this. Contentment is both the fruit and the tree. In other words, it's the cause and effect. It's the cause and the effect. Contentment grows from your character but contentment also depends on your character. I'm going to say that one more time because I know that was a mouthful right there. Contentment grows from your character, but contentment also depends on your character, not your circumstance. Contentment depends on your character, not your circumstance. In other words, where there's poor self-esteem or a lack of values or even no vision, there will be a constant desire to change jobs, move cities, move churches, get a new spouse, in a desperate hunt for contentment and happiness. Because when you're not content, this guy, I need a new husband. This, this girl, I need a new wife. No, 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 no. You need a new perspective. You need a new heart. That's what you need. See, far too often, ah, it's the boss. No, it's not the boss. Listen, you can have a horrible boss. It doesn't mean your job is bad. I get it. Believe me, a lot of us here in this place, don't raise your hand. You probably have a horrible boss. I mean, you're just like, man, God, just remove this boss. If you would just get, remove this boss, it would be a better job. No, 
not really. Because you know what I've learned? I've actually talked with, with quite a few people in this church and outside this church that they would actually tell me, Pastor, pray that I get a new boss. Pray I get a new, okay, I'm going to pray with you because that's what you're asking for. Be careful what you ask for. So I would pray with them, pray with them, all right. Eh? And a couple months later, hey, how's it going? Did you get, did you get a new boss? I go, yeah. So I thought that's what you wanted. <sighs> yeah, but this boss is even worse. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. Be careful that that's what you wanted. That's what you were asking for. Learn how to be content. Because when you're not content, it's going to be a constant hunt for going after something that's going to slip through your hands. In fact, one more car, one more this, one more this, one more pair of that, one more. If I just get one more, then I'll be happy. And my friend, you can strive for it all you want. But you're going to find it just like the carrot. It's always going to be there. And you're going to feel like I can get it. But it's never, ever going to satisfy you. It's just not. You know what I've learned that when it comes to money is that money can buy you fun, but it won't buy you happiness. Money can buy you fun, but it won't buy you happiness. In other words, you can go on vacation. Now, this is very important. I pray that every single one of you are able to go on a vacation. That's my prayer. Go on a vacation. Have a good time. It would be great. I mean, uh, I talk with my wife many a times, and we've, we've had this conversation about purses and shoes and diamonds and all this stuff. And for me as a man, like, that doesn't, I just don't, what in the world? How, how many shoes can you have? I just don't get it. Now, the great thing about it is that my wife is actually really good with that. She is not, you know, into all that stuff. That's not her thing. But when I'll talk to her about, oh, let's get this person a gift, and she'll go, oh, yeah, she'll love shoes. Go, Wait, didn't we get her shoes last time? Oh, no, no, trust me, she'll love it. Why? I just don't get it. And then she starts explaining, well, you guys have this and you guys do that. I go, okay, all right, I, I guess so. And the funny thing is, is that when they open the gift, they go, yay, I'm so happy, right? But you're happy for the moment because then the moment is fleeting. And then it's gone. Thank you for this gift, but don't forget about my birthday next year. You better get me another gift. Like, whoa, 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 hold on one second. See, if you strive after things that are momentary, then that's also where your happiness is in the moment. Because then what happens is here comes a circumstance, and it takes away the momentary happiness. And you're really not happy. You have got to learn. See, when you learn how to be content, then no matter your circumstance, your character carries you through. No matter the, are, are you hearing me this morning? I know that this is more of a teaching. I understand that. But if you catch these principles, it's going to change your life. See, my friend, if we are able to be sure that money does not and will not take a hold of our present or future, then we must learn what it means to rely on Christ. Now, it's a simple term, rely on Christ, but it has a heavy meaning and a strong exercise. Relying on Christ. Tell your neighbor, rely on Christ. Now, I know it's simple. I know it sounds simple. But it has a heavy meaning and strong exercise. Now, just like any exercise habits, you must need a little bit of motivation. you got to have some motivation. Last year, we had an opportunity. We had a few guys get together. And we said, hey, let's do the biggest loser. Like, all right, let's do the biggest loser. And we were all talking, right? And if you don't know what the biggest loser is, the biggest loser is all about uh, we could see, get a group of guys or get a group of girls together and see who could lose the most weight in this amount of time. That's what the biggest loser is. And so, we, all right, okay, let's do it. And I remember when we first got together, we're all talking. I think we were like right here, right outside, and we're all talking. Okay, man, I got, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then one of the guys goes, hey, man, I'm so excited for this. But he goes, but I need you to keep me motivated. Because it's one thing to say it. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop cussing. I'm going stop, I'm to stop all that. I'm going to do all that, all that. That's good on your own to say that because that's a good feeling. But in order to complete that to success, you must get a little bit of motivation. See, that's why we need each other. That's why when it comes to coming to church, we need each other. Can I hear an amen? We're, we're a body of Christ not just one unit. We are a body. 
we got to do this together. So I want to give you just a little bit of motivation. Can I motivate you real quick? I'm gonna, now, I, I had a bunch of points, but I go, you know what? I'm going to cut that one out, cut that one out, cut that one out. And I'm just going to give you the two most important principles that I believe are going to help motivate you. Can I just give you two? I'm just going to give you two. That's it. Okay, motivation tip number one. Are you ready? We're going to exercise right now. So some of you might start sweating after I say it, but it's okay. Sweat is good for you. I need to get some of you in the sauna right now. See, right now you're not in the sauna. You're not in, the, in that place. You know, it's, it's kind of good right now. I know many of you are like, man, it's hot. I'm so hot. Go to the Philippines. You'll feel differently. Trust me. But I know, so, oh, my God, it's hot outside. Are, are you guys cool right now? You guys are pretty cool, right? You're a little cool. It's not real hot. But you might start sweating right now. And you could blame it on the AC. Oh, it was, it was, it was hot in there today at church. I don't know why. Motivational tip number one. Number one, are you ready? I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Act your wage. Act your wage. Act your wage. Listen, learn to live on less than you make. Learn to live on less than you make. That's very important. Listen to me. You're not Kanye West, all right? Learn to live on less than you make. So many people, they go out there, I got all this money, and boom, they just begin to spend it all. No, 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 you don't have that. You don't have that money. Oh, no, no, I, I, no. I, I'm going to get it. Where are you going to get it from? Where's it? Just, money doesn't grow on trees, right? That's what I'll say. Money doesn't grow on trees. It's going to take some hard work. If you want the uh, understanding and the secret of success, learn how to be content with what you have. Matter of fact, the Bible says it like this in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. It says, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Matter of fact, it says in the, new, in the NIV, it says the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. In other words, don't be foolish. Now, I don't know about you, but every time the Bible says the word fool, it's never a good thing. Our society is maybe kind of downplayed it, but whenever the Bible says fool or foolish, it was really, 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 really bad. Matter of fact, the word fool is associated with atheism. It's in there, right? Because only a fool says in their heart, there is no, that's an atheistic view. So foolishness has to do with, I don't need God in my life. So you got to be very careful if you're going to gulp everything down. You have to learn how to store up. Somebody say store up. See, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So in other words, being content is one of the most powerful financial weapons that you can ever use. Listen to me. Keeping up with the Kardashians is a TV show, not a way of life. It's a TV show. I know, I love that show. Be careful, that show don't love you back. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, the more you watch that show, the more money they make. Did you know that? The more you watch that show, the more money they make. And you're like, oh, I love watching it. They love you watching it too. Keep watching it. They don't care. They don't care less. You must understand, if you're going to try, try, see, that's this generation, the past generation, if you're going to try to keep up with the Joneses, it's not going to work for you. It's just not going to work. They're always going to be ahead of you. Great Godliness with contentment. Somebody say contentment. It's great gain. The second tip that I want to give you, first is act your wage. The second one, you got to learn this one, is be a giver. Be a giver. Now, Somebody once said there are three kinds of givers. If you want me to repeat this later to you, I can. But this is really good when I heard this. Three kinds of givers. It's the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. The flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything out of a flint, you must hammer it. And then you get only chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you must squeeze it, and the more you use pressure, the more you will get from the sponge. But the honeycomb just overflows with its own sweetness. So what kind of giver are you? The flint, the sponge, or the honeycomb? Corey Tin Boom said this, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. 
But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. That I still possess. Now, this is very important because I know many of you might be looking at me right now and say, oh, pastor, there he goes. There he goes with this money thing. There he goes with this giving thing. You know what I've learned is that, now, this is very important because I'm not talking about just giving to church. I'm talking about having the spirit of a giver. When you have the spirit of a giver, you learn that all of a sudden you don't give to the church. You have already learned you are the church. You see the difference? You don't give to the church. You already are the church. Matter of fact, I don't have time to get into this whole thing. But did you know that you should even be tithing to yourself? See, everybody always hears about tithes to the church. Which is true. You should tie to the church. Most definitely. That's a part of the biblical principles. You should. You should express your faith. Give to your faith. And tithing also starts at just 10%. But that's the starting line. Somebody say start. But you should also tie to yourself. That's called a savings. That's what the Lord calls it. But that's actual savings is a tithe. You should learn how to tithe to yourself. And say, okay, God, store up for yourselves. That's what the Bible says. You got to learn how to store up. Somebody say store up. You have to store up. Matter of fact, let's put it like this. This is the way the Bible puts it. Matthew chapter 28, verse 17. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Now, somebody say all authority. Somebody say all authority. Now, what really tripped me out about this scripture is that the Bible says that even Jesus himself gave the authority even to doubters. Even the doubters, Christ gave the authority. So that's why sometimes you will see other people, play. how come they're more blessed than I am? I go to church. I have this. All authority has been given when you learn to apply the principles. When you learn this, it will help and change your life. Now, this is very important. Authority. Somebody say authority. Now, right here, we have a speaker, right? We have this speaker. And this speaker costs about $250, right? It's a $250 speaker, even $300 speaker. And uh, so if I get this speaker and I pay $250 and I pay for this speaker, I could take this speaker and I can do what I want with it, right? So if I choose to pick up the speaker, I'm not going to pick it up right now because I'm, I haven't been going to the gym that much right now. It looks like a small speaker, right? That thing's very heavy. You pick that thing up, and if I want to pick it up, and throw it on the ground and break it, I could do that. You know why? Because I pay for it. It's mine. Jesus paid for you. He can do whatever he wants. So if he wants to bless you, he'll bless you. If he wants to bless your neighbor, he'll bless your neighbor. The, run, the sun rises and sets on the good and the bad. Do whatever you want. All authority has been given to you. From us, from, or excuse me, from Christ to you and I, you have the authority. Somebody say authority. authority. Proverbs 29 verse 2, it says, When the righteous are in authority, the people or the city rejoice. When the righteous are in authority, the city rejoices. The word righteous in the Hebrew is translated sadak. Somebody say sadak. Somebody say sadak. Now this is very important. Righteousness and generosity go together. Righteousness and generosity go together. And the, the Hebrew word is sadak. The word generosity in Hebrew is sadaka. So righteousness and generosity in the Hebrew culture, in other words, you can't separate the two. If you're going to be a righteous person, you must be a generous person. In other words, in the kingdom of God, you cannot separate righteousness and generosity. Winston Churchill said it like this. You make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. You make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. Psalms 37 says it this way. Verse 25. I was young and now I'm old. I have yet never seen the righteous forsaken nor their children begging for bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Sadaka, putting other people before ourselves. See, a lot of times we treat or we teach or share righteousness the wrong way. In other words, 
We say, if I don't do this, I'm a righteous person. If I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't say this, I don't go there, I don't club, therefore I am a righteous person. But in the kingdom of God, it's not what you're not doing, it's what you are doing for others. That's what makes a righteous person. Blessed are the righteous. Blessed, blessed are the righteous, righteous. If you want righteousness, you got to learn how to be a giver. Tell your neighbor, learn how to be a giver. Now, there are 2,106 verses in the Bible that connect righteousness with generosity and greed with wickedness. 2,106 verses that connect them together. That is more verses than faith, heaven, and hell combined. More verses on wickedness and greed and generosity and righteousness than there is on you and the sin that you may or may not be committing. Matter of fact, there's a lot of times that you'll see and you'll read in the scriptures where a lot of people that Jesus himself connects somebody who passes by a beggar and says, this person who passed by, yeah, uh, he's not going to make it. He ain't going into heaven. There's so many scriptures that connect them together. See, you and I, we, we look at righteousness like, look, look, I, 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 I'm not going over there. I don't talk like that. No, what are you doing for others? You want to be a generous person. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I get ready to close with this. Verse 6 to 12. Now, this is very important. If you haven't taken any notes, highlight this scripture, write it down, put it in your uh, phone, put it in your tablet, put it somewhere, because you're going to love these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap. Uh, uh, generously, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase you. Store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You see that again? Right there with your righteousness. It says you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Everybody, anybody ever wish that before? God, just give me enough money so that I could bless others. That's what the Bible says right here. He says, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. See, these scriptures show how the Lord is returning an increase materially for you in order to bless those who are in need. In other words, the, that extra closet that you have of extra clothes was not so that you can have an extra time or an extra season of one day I'm going to fit into those bad boys. That's actual seed. I, I, need, I really need you to understand this. I need you to get this. That's actually seed. And when you understand this, and when you get this in your spirit, you won't look at it as, oh, but this is my favorite dress. I know I can't wear it, and I used to wear this back in high school, but one day I'm going to do this. Lord, you know the desires of my heart. Maybe not the desires of my hips right now, but the desires of my heart, Lord. One day. When you understand contentment, you don't look at that dress or those shoes or that hat or that suit as that's what brings you happiness. You look at contentment and you see everything else, not from circumstance, but by seed. By seed. And so when you understand seed, you also understand seasons. Oh, that's another time right there. When you understand seed, you also understand seasons. That's why there are some things that come into your life for a short amount of time. 
how, man, I was only in this car for this amount of time. This thing was supposed to last me longer. Well, it was a seed for a certain season. I don't know why. There are certain things that are supposed to last you a lifetime, like a marriage seed. That's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. And then there are shoes. Mm, nice. These are cool. But now, can I, can I tell you what I do? Can I tell you what I do? I'll just give you what I do. A lot of the men's home, they're wearing my shoes right now. I love giving my, my shoes to the home. I really do. So the other day before I actually got into this message, I went and I counted my shoes. Right? Because I have a certain amount of space for my shoes. And I looked at all my shoes. And I counted all my shoes. I counted them all. I have 12 pairs of shoes. Out of the 12 pairs of shoes, I know somebody like, oh, my gosh, that's a lot of shoes. Ten pairs of shoes you bought me. You guys bought me the shoes. I am buying. The two pairs of shoes that I bought were in the Philippines. With Pastor Toby. He was there with me. I was like, yeah, this is cool. Jordan's for 10 bucks. What? Right? It's cool, though. So I got them from last year. I still have them. They're actually good. They're really cool. So those are the two pair that I bought. But the other ones, you guys bought me. Matter of fact, these right here. How oh, you like that, Frank? You like that? It's cool. Look at that. You, you like, the, this, like those socks right there? Like those socks? Get those socks. You got to get those socks on there. Look at, look, you see those socks? I call these my Noah socks. Because whenever I wear them, it's the promise of God. The rainbow promise of God right there. The socks, they bought for me in Pretoria, South Africa. This suit, you guys bought me. Everything, like almost everything that I have, literally, I've been blessed with. But I also understand this. I have never, I've never, 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 I've, or I once, maybe when I was in junior high or high school, I don't know. But from the time of being saved, my father always taught me this. I've never, ever taken any blessing to always think of it. It's only going to be me and that's it. This is the only person who ever is going to wear this shirt. This is the only person who's going to ever wear this. this the only person going to use. I'm the only person that's going to wear this. I'm the only person that's going to use this. No, I know that one day I may bless somebody. Or even there's been a lot of times where a lot of people have given me stuff and I take, oh, thank you. It just doesn't fit. And I've had to say, well, I'm going to bless somebody with it. Because I understand the seed. I understand what it is. And so there's a lot of times that you're going to have to understand there's going to be things that come into your life that the Lord did and put there for a reason. And the reason sometimes is a season. Matter of fact, there's a story, and I'm going to close with this. There's a story of a little old lady who used to step out on her front porch every morning, and she would raise her arms to the sky, and she would shout, Praise the Lord! One day, there was an atheist that moved into the house next door, and he became irritated with this little old lady. Every morning, he'd step onto his front porch, and after her, he would yell, there is no Lord. Time had passed on, and the two of them kept carrying on this way every day. One morning in the middle of winter, the little old lady stepped out into her front porch and shouted, praise the Lord. Please, Lord, I have no food, and I am starving. Provide for me, O oh Lord. The next morning, she stepped out onto her porch, and there were two huge bags of groceries sitting right there. She went out to her porch and cried out, Praise the Lord, for he has provided groceries for me. The atheist neighbor jumped out from the hedges and shouted, There is no Lord I bought those groceries. The little old lady threw her arms into the air and shouted, Praise the Lord! He has provided me with groceries and made the devil pay for them. Every good and perfect thing comes from above. got to understand that. Every good and perfect thing comes from above. 
And you got to understand these principles. Listen, don't let money have you. Because if you do it, you're going to be in a constant chase, a constant chase, a constant chase, and you're never going to be satisfied. We can give you 100 pairs of shoes. We can give you five cars on the driveway. We can, I mean, we can get all that, but it's never going to satisfy you. It's never going to satisfy you. This is why, and again, I got so much stuff. I just wanted to limit it to this. But I've shared this before, and I'll, I'll share it again. I did a study on lotto winners, people who got money overnight. Did you know the percentage of people that became millionaires overnight through the lotto? And I'm talking a very high percentage. I, I actually, it's not on these notes, but I do have it. I want to say it was around 92 to 95 percent of those that became lotto winners and millionaires overnight lost their money in less than a year. Like 92 percent. That's crazy, huh? You know why? Because they weren't content before the money. You're not going to be content after the money. See, I don't know many of you think, God, all you got to do is just, just bless me with a little extra, right? Just bless me. And you're looking for the blessings from someone else's blessing. When in all reality, God has already blessed you. He's blessed you with wonderful children. But man, me and my child, me and my son, we don't get along. He's still a blessing. Me and my daughter, we just, man, she just, for some reason, we just constantly have strife. She's still a blessing. Every good and perfect thing comes from above. The check that you got, your job is a resource, not the source. You got to understand that. Your job is a resource, not the source. And when you understand that, it changes your whole perspective completely. Now, I understand people get funny when it comes to money, and we talk about it. They, oh, man, pastor, this is, let's not deal with that. But the Bible actually talks about that more than it deals with the immorality that we're going to be talking about later. See, we can easily talk about don't have sex out of marriage. Okay, we can talk about that. We know that. It's there in the Bible. But when it comes to finances, no, nah, pastor, hey, chill out. That's, that's too far. It's actually not too far. It is not too far. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's so many scriptures, I mean, just left and right, left and right. What does that mean? What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about, listen, I'm going to pray, and I've prayed this before. I'm, I'm praying that God is going to make a millionaire out of this church. I truly believe that. But, but hear me when I say this. Make a millionaire. In other words, you're going to go through the process of it, of what it takes to become within the millions. But before you do that, can you handle $10? Can you handle $100? Can you handle $1,000? Can you handle $10,000? Can you handle $100,000? Can you handle a half a minute? I believe that some of you can. See, some of you right now, I'm stretching your faith. Some of you went from, oh, $10, yeah, $100, yeah, $1,000, yeah, $10,000, oh, 100000 whoa, 500 well, You see how all of a sudden the demeanor changes, your spirit changes? Like, I don't know. God's going to make you that. I believe that. I believe God can. If God has given you the promise. Now, this is what you have to understand. Don't let it find its way into your heart because there's a root that can captivate you and it can get you it's like oh no I just I can't okay but for whatever reason the Bible says the righteous they're generous and yet they lack for nothing how does that work that doesn't make any sense it's a biblical principle it makes sense to kingdom minded folks I want to pray for you bow your heads Father I pray right now Lord God that you would touch the hearts and minds and the bodies of the people that are here this morning. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is what I want to do. I want to pray for those of you that you're not a tither.
fruit giver. But here today, you want to be a first fruit giver. I want to pray for you. 